On the left side here, we're talking about the Anita function. And for this particular problem, I've got Anita of 3 is equal to 7. And one of the things then that we're talking about is an inverse function. And what that is really saying is, you know what? I've got an output of 7. If I put it into the inverse function, that's going to equal 3. So I'm taking, the inverse function takes a, func a regular function and it works it backwards. So while the starting function gives me the order pair 3, 7, knowing that the 3 was the input and the 7 was the output, if I have the inverse function, I just reverse the order of those ordered pairs. There's also a graphical representation to inverses. And let's go to the Cartesian plane for this real quick. Now let's just say that the uh, inverse function, or the regular function, Anita, might have, might have had something that looks a little bit like this. Let's say it was a line. Well, inverses do something interesting graphically. If I have the line y equals x drawn here, Inverses are a reflection across the y equals x line. So if I draw the reflection, which is the inverse, I'm going to have something that looks kind of like this. So if I was able to lift this Cartesian plane off, of, off the iPad here, I'd be able to fold it across the line y equals x, and the two functions would actually touch each other. So as we talk about inverses, one of the functions that I want to focus in on here is the function y equals x squared. And I'm going to graph a couple of points here to illustrate my point about inverses. And I'm graphing the points negative 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0. And I'm going to rough sketch this, knowing that negative 2, 4 would be my next point. And 2, 4 would also be one of my points. Now, I've got the line of reflection drawn that for inverses y equals x. You'll notice that our function for y equals x squared actually uh, dips below the y equals x uh, as we're looking between the x quantities 0 and 1. That doesn't really matter because I can take this function, I can still, if I could lift this Cartesian plane off of the screen right now, I could fold it in half across that y equals x and if I did that and was actually uh, able to see where the reflection was, this portion here gets reflected across the axis like this. Then the part that's greater than 1, the part that's greater than 1 out here, also gets reflected across that line y equals x and is going to look something like this. And then I've got this chunk over here. When I reflect that across the axis, is just going to look something like this. So if I take these ordered pairs that I have started with with our original function, I've got the ordered pair negative 1, 1. The inverse point is going to be, just flip the x and y coordinates around, I'm going to end up with 1, negative 1. And my sketch might be off a little bit, but I do indeed have the point 1, negative 1 is a part of the graph. Then the other side of this, the graph actually does intersect with our line of reflection here at the point 1, 1. So not only is 1, 1 a point on our original function, it's also a point of our inverse. And you'll see the same thing happens with the point 0, 0. 0, 0 and 0, 0 are points in the function and in the inverse function, and they intersect with our line of reflection, y equals x. So as you think more about these uh, particular points, how inverses can be graphically represented, remember that the point negative 2, 4 is going to be a part of our function uh, y equals x squared, and that's going to be somewhere up in this direction. And what is going to be the point for the inverse function? Remember, all you do is take your coordinates for your original function, negative 2, 4, switch the position of those two numbers, and I'm going to end up with the point 4, 2. 
which the point 0.42 is going to be down this way somewhere. That's all there is to inverses. We've got um, ways of taking the points, swapping the position of the coordinates for to create an inverse, and there's also the graphical way of doing that, reflecting our original function across the line y equals x. And just to note something here, as you take a look at the inverse, is the inverse a function? Remember, use your vertical line test there. Not all inverses are functions. And hope this helps clarify some things about inverses, and we'll continue our discussion on the next pages. When we're talking about inverse functions, you'll see the function that's listed there is f of x is equal to 1 half x plus 6. Remember, as we're actually creating a table of points so that we can graph this line, we'll more likely refer to it as y equals 1 half x plus 6. Now the question for uh, part A is, what are the steps necessary to undo the function? In other words, what is the inverse of this particular function? I think the most straightforward way to do this is to rewrite the equation that you have listed, swapping the variables, and then solve for y. So we're going to start with this, and then I'm going to resolve for y to give us the equation that is equal to the inverse. And in order to do this, I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. And then I'm going to end up multiplying everything by 2. I'm going to end up with 2x minus 12 is equal to y. And this, then, is equal to the inverse of our original function. And to prove that this is actually the truth of this, if I have some number and I plug it into the original function, let's say I have the number 2, f of 2 is equal to 1 half of 2 plus 6, which is equal to 7. So now I should be able to take that number 7 plug it into the inverse function, and I should get out the number 2, which is what I started with. So the inverse, remember this is the equation for our inverse right here, so I have 2 times 7 minus 12. So I have 14 minus 12, which is equal to 2. So I plugged the 7 back in, I did get 2 out, so the function and its inverse did take us on a circular path, where I started with 2, it led us to 7, and then plugging that 7 into the inverse led us back to where we started, the number 2. Another important topic to discuss is operations with functions. Operations with functions are really no different than working with variables. For instance, if I've got f plus g of x, that is sim as simply stated as I can make it is, substitute in whatever you have for your functions and then do any kind of simplification that you can do. So this particular operation here is just saying, take f, whatever f is defined to be, maybe f is the function uh, f of x equals x squared. Plug it in here. And then maybe g of x is, say, um, x plus 7. Add those two functions together. Any simplification you can do, great. If not, you're done. Then we might have, um, let's take those same two functions, we might be asked to subtract them. So I might have f of x minus g of x. And you'll notice a slight variation in the notation between the first example I have. I could have written that as f of x plus g of x, or I can write f, of g, f plus g of x. They mean the same exact things. But this is going to be x squared, and then I'm going to subtract g of x, which is x plus 7. Same kind of arithmetic manipulation going on here. And if I want to distribute that negative through, I can. And multiplication is no different. The uh, expression f of x times g of x, I substitute in what I have for these functions. And f of x is still going to be our x squared. And I'm still saying that g of x is x plus 7. And then I would uh, expand that. I could say that this is x cubed plus 7x squared. The last operation I want to discuss here for right now is the quotient, fun um, quotient operation with functions. 
Uh, the biggest thing you have to be aware of is remember whatever function you have on the bottom, remember that this operation of functions, uh, you can do it so long as g of x does not equal 0. Composition of function is uh, something that students will oftentimes have a little bit of trouble with. So let's uh, start by defining a couple of functions here. I'm going to define f of x to be x squared. And g of x, let's say that that is x plus 2. And we write composition of functions a couple different ways. Uh, the definition I'm going to stick with most often is like this f of g of x. What that is saying is that f is composed of g of x. In other words, g of x is within f. If I know what g of x is, it is defined. What I can say, using substitution, I can also say, instead of f of g of x, I could say f of x plus 2. And then I would substitute this x plus 2 in the equation for f of x. So since f of x is actually x squared, then f of g of x is simply x plus 2 squared. And then I can go through and actually simplify that statement. I can expand it out if I, would, if I so desire. I can also work this the other way. I could say g of f of x. So in other words, the function g is composed of f of x. So then g of x is going to be equal to, this is g of, what is f? x squared. So anywhere there's an x in the function g, I substitute in x squared, and that is going to be x squared plus 2. A very important topic we're going to discuss here comes out of this problem 1-34. What are the roots, also called the zeros, of the function? Well, if f of x is equal to x cubed minus 4x, what we're really saying is take this function, set it equal to 0. Where is this true? This is where you're going to need to be uh, reviewing your fa how to factor if you don't recall how to do that. So I've got... As I factor this, I'm going to pull an x out of both terms. I'm left with x times x squared minus 4. I can continue to factor this because the x squared minus 4, this quantity right here, is a difference of perfect squares. So I can f continue factoring that. One of the linear factors is x plus 2, and the other one is x minus 2. Whenever we're factoring, we want to try to get things down to what we call linear factors. In other words, the exponent inside the quantity here is simply 1. So if I graph that one single segment, I end up with a line. And then this statement is true if this piece, this piece, or this piece are equal to 0. And when does that happen? Well, this will equal 0 if x equals 0. It's also going to equal 0 if this piece equals 0. And that happens if x is equal to negative 2. It's also going to happen if this quantity is equal to 0. So when x minus 2 is equal to 0, that happens when x is positive 2. So I'm going to say when this is plus or minus 2. So I've added in the actual graph for x cubed minus 4x so I can illustrate a point to you. Actually, literally illustrate points to you. So if you take a look at this graph, our solutions that we came up with for our equation x cubed minus 4x were x equals 0, x equals a positive 2, and x equals a negative 2. Do you see what's happening with the graph there? These solutions, from a graphical standpoint, are where this graph intersects the x-axis. So anytime we're talking about the roots of a function, also called the zeros, it's because in the graphical representation of the function, that is where that graph intersects the x-axis. And I hope that makes some sense to you because if I was actually considering the points when x is equal to 0, if I plug 0 into the function, that evaluates to 0. 
When I plug in negative 2, I get out 0. When I plug in 2, I also get out 0. That's where the phrase, the zeros, come from, from the y-coordinate being equal to 0 in each of these three points. In problem 1-37, I want to do the inverses of these particular functions. I want to do the inverse for g of x, and then we'll take a look and see do we actually need to do the inverse for h of x or not. So start by writing the function down. I'm also going to rewrite it, showing that this is actually, e I could uh, write in y equals the square root of 2x plus 4. Now whenever we're trying to find what an inverse is, what I want to do is I want to swap the variables. So we're going to have x equals the square root of 2y plus 4. Now I need to solve for y again. So I'll start by squaring both sides. So I end up with x squared is equal to 2y plus 4. Still solving for y, I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides. So I have 2y is going to be equal to x squared minus 4. And then dividing both sides by 2, I'm going to have x squared over 2 minus 2 is equal to y. And then just to clean it up a little bit, let's write it with the, vari the y variable on the left-hand side. So y is equal to 1 half x squared minus 2 which is equal to h of x. So the inverse of function g is h. So if I was calculating the inverse of h, wouldn't I get g? So a function has an inverse, and the inverse of the inverse is the function. So from a practical standpoint, what this means in problem 1-38, where they're saying it, it's apparent that these two functions are inverses of each other, when I'm looking at g of h of 4, since g and h are inverses of each other, I don't even need to do a calculation. Because what I know is that if I take 4, plug it into h, I'm going to get out some number. If I take that some number, plug it into g, I'm going to get back the number 4. Same thing happens if I reverse the order. It doesn't matter what order we actually do this composition of functions either. If I plug negative 1 into g, I'm going to get out some number. If I take that some number, plug it into h, I'm going to get back out what I started with at negative 1. So hopefully you see the pattern here. There's really not a whole lot going on here because these are inverses of each other. The g and the h, or the h and the g, are essentially canceling each other out. So you get out what you started with. And just to illustrate that this is actually shoot, um, actually happens with the arithmetic part of this, let's look at that g of h of 4. So if I plug 4 into h, what is h of 4? That's equal to 1 half 4 squared minus 2, which is going to be equal to this half of 16, would be 8, minus 2 is 6. So I take the 6 and plug it into g now. And when I plug that 6 into g, I get the square root of 2 times 6 plus 4. So I get 12 plus 4, which is 16. The square root of 16 is equal to 4, which is what I started with right back here. So I plug 4 in, I got 6 out. I took the 6, plug it into G, and I got 4 back out. So I ended up going round and round in a circle there. The inverse of a function, cancel, they cancel each other out. Trig functions also have an inverse function to it. Like in the triangle listed in 1-39a, if I take a look at the sine of x, that is equal to the ratio of the length of the sides. The opposite side is 7. The hypotenuse is 12. Well, I need to know what angle measure is going to be equal to the ratio 7 twelfths. And in order to do that, I need to solve for x. Well, the way we do that is, since I have 
a sine function, I need to take the inverse of this quantity, sine x. Well, I can't do something to the left-hand side of the equation without doing the same thing to the right-hand side. So I'm going to take the inverse sine of both sides. Now remember, inverse functions cancel each other out, so the net effect on the left side of the equation is to leave, is to leave me with just x, and the right-hand side is going to be the inverse sine of 7 twelfths. This is going to give me what my angle measure is. And make sure you note whether your calculator is set to radian mode or degree mode, because if I get an answer here that's in degrees, I want to label it, and it, I might have some kind of label such as uh, maybe it's 48 degrees. I'm taking a guess here. But if it's in radians, radians don't have labels. All right, so the other point I want to make here, as you're looking at your calculator for this particular function, or you're using a free graph calculator, there's two different ways you're going to see these trig functions written, the inverse trig functions written. Uh, sine with a negative 1 to it, or cosine or tangent written with that negative 1 to it, is the most common way that you're going to see this represented today. An older way of doing it is to have an A sign written, and that stands for arc sign. Arc sign is a little bit older terminology, and it's not used as often anymore, but these are the same thing. Whether I have inverse sine of x, A sine of x, or it's actually written out arc sine of x, depending on which textbook you're looking at or which online resource you're accessing, you could see any one of these three listed. Although, remember that this is the most common representation for inverse trig functions. For problem 1-40, it says to find a reasonable equation for each of the function graph below. And one of the, I do want to give you just a slight clue here. The parent graph for the first function is going to be y equals x cubed. And the parent graph for the second one is y equals 2 to the x. So you're going to have to play with some manipulation here, some adding and subtracting of numbers. Do I do something inside the, the uh, argument? So for the first one, for a, do I take the x? And do I write it something like this? Do I do an x plus 2 and cube that quantity? Does that give me the downward and right shift that I'm looking for? Or do I need to do some other kind of manipulation to it? Maybe I need to subtract some kind of quantity outside the cube portion of our, of our function. And do the same thing then with y equals 2 to the x. Manipulate that x and see, if you, see what you can do to duplicate the graph that's shown. With the challenge problem, as you attempt this, Remember what you're what we've been working with here in this particular section is inverses. So it might help if you actually graph this particular equation. Now what I've drawn there is y equals x, which is the line of reflection for inverses. So I want to take a look at this particular function here. y equals 3x minus 2. So I've got a slope of 3, and I know that this goes through the point 0, negative 2, which is our uh, y-intercept. So with a slope of 3, this is going to intersect our line y equals x where? At the point 1, 1. So approximately here. So I've got two points on here. I can try to sketch a line now. That looks something like this. Not a very straight line, but you get the rough idea of what's going on here. Remember, the slope of this line is 3. It intersects the y-axis at negative 2. Now if I draw what the inverse is going to look like, since I have a point 0, negative 2, the inverse point is negative 2, 0. The point 1, 1, since it actually intersects y equals x, that's shared between both, uh, both of these graphs. And then I can draw a line that connects those points, and it is a mirror reflection. And really what this means is, being a mirror reflection, remember, if I draw a perpendicular line anywhere on our line of reflection, the point that this intersects down here on our original function is the same distance from our y equals x line 
as the reflected point on our inverse. So this distance is the same as this distance, and that will apply to any point on our function. So now I've got two points that are given on our inverse. I've got the, the one point is the same as um, what was existing in our regular function here. I've got the point 1, 1. I've also got the point negative 2, 0. From this, I hope you can determine what the slope of this equation is. Hopefully you can figure out what the y-intercept is, and you can come up with an equation for j of x. Compare h of x and j of x to each other, and see what is significant about the inverse of an equation of a line.